So hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on multiple myeloma. This webinar is organized by the WBMT and the AS-TCT. My name is Sebastian Galeano. I co-chair the WBMT Education Committee with Professor Yoshiha Kodera. Uh, I would like to thank especially Kira Newman for her support in the organization of this uh, webinar. I will be moderating this session with Damiano Rondelli. Damiano is the chair of the ASTCT Committee on International Affairs. And Damiano is uh, there. Hello, Damiano. So please, Damiano, continue. Maybe you can uh, present uh, the, our speakers today. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, good, well, I'm saying good morning because in Chicago it's morning. Any of you is going to be different time. I want to rem remind everybody that this is a recorded session. And then you will be able to uh, watch these videos uh, <clears throat> in the uh, WBMT website, as well as in the STCT website uh, very soon. Uh, thank you for being here. Also, let me remind you that there's going to be, as you can see in the screen right now, a question and answer session that we would invite you to uh, participate by submitting your questions in the chat. Uh, as you can see in the screen, uh, the box in the bottom of your screen, the Q&A uh, symbol. Um, Without uh, any any delay, I want to introduce the, the first speaker of this uh, webinar. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Andrew Cohen. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle and is a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Uh, he will give us a talk on the global state of the hematopoietic stem cell transplant for multiple myeloma results of the WBMT survey. Please. All right, thank you very much for the, um, the kind introduction. Uh, and I'm very uh, <clears throat> uh, honored to, to be able to speak today. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be presenting is data that were initially presented at um, the American Society of Hematology meeting last year and recently published in Biology of Blood and Marrow Transplant. It was our analysis of the data from the Worldwide Network of Blood and Marrow Transplantation and the Global Burden of Disease Study regarding utilization of hematopoietic cell transplantation for multiple myeloma. So um, just a bit of background, uh, and we will talk about this again later, just to review, I know many of you are familiar with this, what are considered to be, you know, if we had a gold standard for treatment of multiple myeloma, what would that look like? and acknowledging that this may differ in other countries, but I think this would be, you know, if we had everything available, this would be the best approach for a transplant eligible patient. We typically start with three drug combinations, including a proteasome inhibitor and an immunomodulatory agent, followed by autologous stem cell transplantation and maintenance. For those who are not transplant eligible, the transplant step is typically admitted and we sometimes give two drug regimens for the frail patients and then supportive care begins at the time of diagnosis and continues throughout. But again, autologous stem cell transplant is still considered to be, you know, a very important part of treatment for multiple myeloma, even with the advent of the, the new, uh, no, not no longer new anymore, but highly efficacious drugs. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Again, autologous stem cell transplantation is considered a standard of care for eligible multiple myeloma patients globally. And we, we have some randomized studies. The most recently published was the IFM 2009 trial, which demonstrated that uh, in transplant eligible patients receiving RVD induction, that autologous stem cell transplant still uh, results in an improvement in progression-free survival. Uh, the sister study for that, uh, the determination trial, uh, was conducted in the U.S., and we are eagerly awaiting the results from that. But again, the, the data we have to date uh, still demonstrates uh, significant benefit. The acute toxicities are manageable. Uh, and importantly, I think, uh, it, it, similar to the story for many of our of the drugs, uh, in many countries, access to transplantation may be very limited. Uh, shown here... Uh, is the global incidence of multiple myeloma depicted uh, for 2016. This is a color-coded map, and I really just showed this to illustrate that my, multiple myeloma is not just disease of industrialized 
uh, or so-called industrialized countries. It is a it is a global disease. It affects every every nation, some more than others, and <clears throat> some much more than others. You can see the red quoted countries have the highest uh, age standardized incidence per 100,000, and the blue are much lower. Um, we saw a, a substantial increase in multiple myeloma incident cases from 1990 to 2016. And we think that at least some of the differences in incidence may be due to availability of diagnostics and under ascertainment. Um, we also know that there are disparities in access and utilization of effective anti-myeloma therapy as well. Uh, in, uh, <clears throat> we also looked at um, uh, global approval of lenalidomide and bortezomib as of 2018 uh, in the bottom right. And as you can see, this, the, the countries shown in red or yellow, uh, we either had no data or the drugs were not approved. Um, for, for anyone who lives in those countries, if these data are incorrect, please let me know. <laughs> uh, the uh, transplant rates are also shown here. This was data from the B WBMT, and uh, you can see that transplantation rates vary pretty dramatically. So it was really, you know, this observation that we have uh, uh, unequal access to drugs and to effective therapy that led us to to query the to work with the WBNT and and with the um, uh, the GBD study to really look at uh, utilization of hematopoietic cell transplantation for multiple myeloma and so we aimed in this analysis to determine region specific rates and numbers of, of both autologous and allogeneic cell transplantations for multiple myeloma. Uh, <clears throat> our, an overview of our study design is shown here specifically with respect to the data sources. So um, the WBMT uh, was the source uh, for the number of auto and allo transplants. Uh, this is a survey of all transplant, all participating transplant teams worldwide. Um, and we had data for autologous and allogeneic transplants for plasma cell dysphagias in 2006, and then multiple myeloma only from 2007 to 2015. Um, and note that in terms of allo transplants, the type of allo transplant that, is, that we um, included here is the first allo transplant, so not an allo for relapsed multiple myeloma. Second, uh, data on incidence and, um, <clears throat> and, and, and so on is from the Global Burden of Disease Study. Uh, that is a study that's conducted by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, where uh, I work. And this, these were the data that we initially published a couple of years ago. We were able, we were able to use data from this uh, publicly available data on multiple myeloma incidents from 2006 through 2015, and have data not only for all ages incidence data, but also data for those less than 70. Um, <clears throat> the analysis that we conducted are shown here. We, we, we uh, report on the number of first transplants from multiple myeloma per year from 2006 through 2015. And we also uh, separated them by world regions. We didn't have the ability to go down to the level of countries. Uh, again, uh, Europe, we only report the first allo transplant, which includes both tandem auto allo and first allo, all the regions reported first allo only, and then to determine transplant utilization, which is a, a, a crude calculation, we did that by just taking the total number of transplants uh, divided by the gross incidence uh, per region times 100. And then we conducted separate analyses for all ages. And then given that some countries uh, limit receipt of transplant to, the, to 65 or 70, we conducted a separate analysis for those under 70 to truly try to get a sense of the utilization in the population who would use the therapy. Um, and then just shown here are the world regions. These are very loosely similar to the WHO or World Bank regions. So just keep this in mind when looking at the data that I'm gonna show. So uh, 
first of all, uh, shown here are the baseline numbers uh, of auto transplants, as well as the global utilization. So globally, there was a 55% increase in auto transplants for multiple myeloma, uh, increasing from 9.9%. Uh, and you can see global line is this dotted green line here to 15.4%. So we've really, we really have seen uh, a pretty dramatic increase in, in uh, transplant utilization uh, over the past uh, you know, uh, 15 years. Uh, strikingly, I think in North America and Europe, uh, the utilization of transplants in 2015 was 25% and 22%, which, which you can see here is also a pretty dramatic increase. And then even in, in other regions of the world where transplant is less well utilized, we've seen increases as well. Uh, the increase in Africa and Eastern Mediterranean increased uh, up to 4% by 2015. And then in Latin America, we saw a dramatic increase up to 11% by 2015. Um, a slightly different story for allo transplants. Um, <clears throat> and I think it, it somewhat mirrors um, some of, you know, perhaps, uh, I guess I would say the, the controversies uh, that have surrounded this. Um, but it, it remains utilized, just not as commonly utilized, especially in North America. Uh, auto transplants saw increasing utilization globally, but allo transplant, uh, in contrast, the numbers have largely, I think, gone down. Um, you, uh, the European region seems to have had the most consistent use of allo transplants, whereas in North America, we've seen, uh, and I think this mirrors what we've seen in our practice uh, at Fred Hutch, even where we've, we've done a lot of allo transplants for myeloma, we've seen the numbers drop dramatically by over. Uh, 50%. Uh, in all of the countries, the numbers remain quite low, but but relatively stable. So allo transplants are still being done, but they, they have really kind of fallen off in terms of their utilization. Um, uh, and then finally, looking at the, you know, I guess you could say the population of interest, uh, those under 70, again, so the, with age being somewhat of an arbitrary cutoff, but I know that you know, in some regions that age is used as a, as a, as a decision for, for, for whether a patient can have a transplant. And in that group, we saw that utilization of auto transplant was, was 27.7% globally, which is a 53% increase since 2006. Uh, and allo transplant was only 0.94%, which again has declined. Uh, now, what I think what's really, really interesting here is that the, the very high utilization rates in, the, in, in North America and Europe are approaching 50%. So 50% of patients, if we, you know, uh, are getting, who, who are, quote, transplant eligible are getting transplants, which I think is, is great. And then I think it's also really excellent to see increases in, in other regions as well. Especially, you know, considering all the all the wonderful things about transplant that it is, you know, compared to other drugs, it is it is, you know, I think uh, arguably uh, more cost effective, uh, and um, <clears throat> and so I think it is it is nice to see that we're we're seeing increases kind of globally, not just in in North America and Europe. Uh, so, I think in summary. Some world regions have in dramatically increased transplant over the past nine years, particularly Latin America. Uh, but as you can see, you know, there remains a disparity in transplant utilization uh, comparing the, the high income SDI regions with the lower middle income regions. Um, with respect to uh, allo transplants, I think uh, <clears throat> few would argue that conflicting clinical trial data is probably uh, uh, led to declines. Probably also, I would say, especially in North America, the more widespread availability of other uh, therapies such as CD38 antibodies uh, and 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 second generation and second generation proteasome inhibitors and IMIDs, and really more work I think is needed to improve access to transplant of an effective therapy for myeloma patients globally. Now, one important limitation is we used incidence data from the GBD. Some data <clears throat> are probably limited due to under or diagnostic limitations. 
uh, but I think uh, this is as close as we're going to get. So uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present, uh, especially to the WBMT and to uh, Dr. Niederweiser and Helen Baldomero, who really helped, spear helped me spearhead this effort, as well as to all our other collaborators, to the Global Burden of Disease Study. Um, and Dr. Fitzmaurice is no longer there, but she really helped uh, get, the, get that going from the start and also to uh, the IHME and, and my institution. So with that, uh, I will conclude and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Um, remember that you can ask questions with the chat and we will, we will uh, answer them at, at the end during the panel discussion. Now we continue with the second uh, conference. It, uh, I will present uh, Amado Carduz. Amado is from Colombia, from the Instituto de Cancerología Clínica Las Americas. And he represents the Latin American Bone Marrow Transplantation Group. Amado will discuss the pros and cons of uh, autologous transplant in multiple myeloma without cryo cryopreservation. Thank you, Sebastian. I, I am start to share my screen. One second, please. Wow. Okay, uh, thank you, Sebastian, for the very kind invitation to share with all of you some data about the performing autologous transplant in myeloma patient without cure preservation. I don't have any to disclose. As all of you know, the usual way to preserve the chronogenetic capacity uh, for the cells after they are collected and before the reinfusion by cryopreservation. However, this technique has some uh, disadvantages. It's expensive, it's time consuming, needs a lot of resources, it's labor intensive, and indeed it can be a little bit dangerous because the potential toxicity of the methyl sulfoside. There is another alternative, which is the uh, refrigeration of the cell in a normal blood bank uh, uh, fridge. Uh, during the rest of the conference, I will show you uh, enough evidence that uh, show the uh, it's safe to refrigerate the cell in a blood bound fridge until six day, and in this cell can preserve the chronogenetic capacity for restoring the hematopoiesis in autologous transplant. First of all, I would like to start with some laboratory data. This is a very old paper. Uh, it came from Germany. In this uh, paper, the authors studied the sample for 14 patients that were transplanted with the autologous peripheral blood stem cell. They stored the sample for every of each in a blood bank fridge, and every day was tested the um, chlorinated capacity, measuring the number of GM colony. As you can see in the curve, the uh, recovery of the GM colony is stable, very stable until more or less day four, and after that, it started decreasing, but still, at this at day six, the uh, chronogenetic capacity is around 50%. In the left part of the slide, you can see that the viability uh, is also uh, very good, near to 80%. We published uh, this, uh, this paper some years ago, indeed in 2004, and we showed the result of 47 patients with hematological malignancy who received an autologous peripheral breast cell transplant with no frozen cells. The cells were uh, kept in a blood bank fridge for six days, and we tested the number of GM colony at the moment of the collection and also just before the reinfusion. As you can see, the recovery of the uh, GM colony at the moment of the reinfusion and after six days of refrigeration is 50%. Very similar result that the was obtained by the Germany paper. Different continents, different countries, different protocol same result at this day uh, of uh, the cell uh, being in a, a normal bank fridge 
the chronogenic capacity is present near to 50%, and the viability 80%. This is a more recent data for our group, 50 and 55 patients who receive a transplant uh, for lymphoma after six days or regeneration the cells, the viability is almost 80% in most of them. That means that this data are reproducible, it's possible to keep enough chronogenetic capacity of the uh, peripheral blood stem cell in a block uh, bank refrigerator until six days. How can we compare this result with the result that are obtained after towing cryopreserved cells? There are two studies, one for Seattle and another more recent for uh, some uh, center in Brazil. As you can see in the uh, highlight part in yellow, the recovery of the GN colony after towing cryopreserved cells is one more time near to 50% and the viability is near to 80%. In the, the right part of the slide, you can say the same, the viability, the, sorry, the number, the recovery of GM colony after towing cryopreserved cells is near 50% and the uh, viability near to 80%. That means that the results that uh, is possible to obtain after six days of refrigeration in a blood blank fridge are very similar to the results that are obtained after towing cryopreserved cells. That means that uh, six days is enough time for performing a myeloma transplant, indeed for performing a, a lymphoma, a, a transplant in lymphoma patient. Now I am going to move some uh, clinical data. In our, in our region, in Latin America, this technique has been used for several years, more than 20 years. Indeed, an important number of the publications regarding this issue come from this uh, region. Uh, the number of uh, publications, indeed, is, is important. In this uh, systematic review that was published in 2007, there are a summary of at least 16 uh, series of transplant doing uh, without uh, cryopreservation. As you can see, the number to the total patient is uh, a little bit more than 500. The engraftment was very, very good, almost all of the patients engraftment. And this uh, publication come for several countries, not only for a developing country, it's not for, for uh, several countries. However, this uh, publication uh, has some, uh, some weakness is uh, that most of them included a relative small number of patients. Uh, heterogeneous disease, heterogeneous preparative regimen, and heterogeneous time of storage. Fortunately, we have more recent information with more homogeneous disease, with more homogeneous conditioning, and with more homogeneous time of refrigeration. Under the auspicious of our group, under the auspicious of Latin American Bone Marrow Transplant Group, we did this retrospective analysis, uh, collecting the data from five different centers in Latin America, Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia. We collect and analyze all the consecutive patients with myeloma or lymphoma that were transplanted without cryopreservation preservation for 2002 to 2016. In total was uh, 359 patients. Regarding the myeloma patient, the number uh, that we collect and study was 216. In the left part of the slide, you can see the usual scheme. A mobilization only with finger steam without chemo uh, for five days on day fifth and sixth. Uh, uh, first, it was undergone, and the cell go to the fridge for two or three days. Why the melphalan was administered in one or two days, depending on the center. On day zero, the cell was reinfused, and after that, all the patients, or at least most of the patients, received finger steam. You can see in this part in the uh, grease box. The dose of melphalan, most of the patients receive the full dose of melphalan, the number of CD34 collected, and the viability uh, after the, uh, before the reinfusion. Very good, 90% after three days of refrigeration. These are the results. The, hemat the hematopoiesis recovery was universal. 100 of the patients had engrassment. The engrassment was fast, 14 days for a uh, neutrophil engrassment and 16 days for um, a platelet engrassment. You can see in the bottom part, the speed of the recuperation that was good, more similar or very similar to what is obtained after a transplant with cryopreserved cells. 
the mortality was low, 1.8%, and the overall survival of five years, uh, 50% what is expected for this kind of patient. Remember that the important number of patients were transplanted between 2005, 2007, that means that in, indeed, an uh, important number of these patients were uh, treated with bad or with chemo and not with novel agent because the time uh, that uh, they were transplanted. There are uh, more series about transplant patient and myeloma patient without the preservation. This is another recent series. It came from India. 2004 patients were transplanted with no frozen cells. Uh, one more time, the engraftment was almost universal. Only one patient did it in graft. All of the, of the rest of the patient had very fast engraftment. A 12 days for uh, reco recovery of the neutrophil, 17 days for recovery of the platelet. Um, this is the um, uh, mortality in relation with the transplant. This and other series are all recent series in the last five years. And in the right part of the slide, in, in the blue box, you can see a summary of the, this last uh, recent series. In total, 620 patients were transplanted. This is the median of CD3-4 that was infused. And as you can see, the engrassment was very, very, very good. The rate of grade failure was only 0.32%. The speed of the recuperation very fast, 11 days for neutrophil, 13 days for platelet, and the uh, mortality was between 0 and 3.2%. That means that the data for more than 60, 600 patients support the use of refrigerated peripheral blood stem cell for transplanting myeloma patients. Um, this procedure is safe and produces very similar results that were obtained with the use of pure cell cell. Uh, I know this conference this talk is about myeloma, but I would like to show you a couple of slides about the, this technique, but in this case, supporting the autotransplant in patients with uh, lymphoma in relapse. Uh, this is the scheme of our center, and indeed, the scheme that are used for uh, different centers in, in Latin America. The uh, mobilization is the same, fibrastin without chemo for five days. On day six and five and six, a uh, high volume of aphoresis is done. The cells went to the blood bank refrigerator for six days, while in this time is administered B or CBB. As you know, uh, most of the time, uh, or most, in the, most of the center administer B and CBB in six or seven or indeed in eight days. With a small modification, you can package, you can shorten the time of the administration of B and CBB without, without decrease the full intensity of those in five days. And on day zero, the cells are refused and the patient received later on filgrastin. Uh, these are the results in our study. Uh, 140 patients were transplanted with lymphoma or Hodgkin disease uh, in relapse. The hematological recovery was 99%. Only one patient didn't engraft. Fortunately, this patient was a uh, successful uh, uh, rescue with a haplotransplant. The speed of recuperation, one more time, good. 12 days for neutrophil and 60, 17 days for platelet. The uh, mortality is low. That means that it's no more toxic. Administer B or CBB in five days uh, and not in six or seven days. This is the uh, overall survival, which is more or less the spec for this kind of patient. Uh, in the bottom part, there are the curve or the speed of the recuperation. And we decide to, to do a comparison between the speed of the recuperation in the group of uh, myeloma patients with cells were refrigerated for three days and uh, with the uh, group of lymphoma patients with cells were refrigerated for six days. As you can see, there was no any difference, any statistical difference between the speed of the recuperation in the group that the cells were uh, refrigerated for three days than the group that the cells were refrigerated for six days. This is another example, this is another uh, uh, data that support that the cells can keep the enough chronogenetic capacity for restoring the hematopoiesis after six days of refrigeration in a normal block bank uh, refrigerator. Uh, I can conclude that, uh, of course, the autologous transplant 
uh, we sell a uh, no frozen cell uh, is that refrigerated uh, in a, a normal uh, fridge or broadband is safe, produce a, a reliable and safe engraving. Uh, the main advantage of CUR is its simplicity, low cost. This is very important. This is very important. You can use this technique with the more usual preparative regime for uh, myeloma and lymphoma patients, mefalan, CBB, or, or, or bean. And for uh, countries like Latin American countries, for uh, developing countries, countries with some economical problem, is uh, very important because this technique is very easy to use in areas with a limited resource. Um, uh, of course, these are uh, uh, some disadvantages. Maybe the, 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 the mainly is you need a, a very big good uh, synchronization, the very good uh, coordination between all the packages, between the apheresis, the hospitalization of the patient, uh, administration of the conditioning, and the refusion of the cell. With the idea to don't uh, to not uh, waste time uh, while, while doing that. Of course, it's not possible to use with conditioning, with preparative regimen that lasts for more than six days. Of course, also it's not possible for use uh, for using in, in patients who need more than one transplant. Um, uh, but it's a very, very good way to increase the number of patients who has which has access to a transplant, especially in countries with economical uh, uh, problems. Finally, I will uh, give some credit to this uh, colleague. Uh, they were, you can say, the pioneer of the of the of the this technique in Latin America. Guillermo and David Gomez from Mexico, Francisco from Colombia. All of them are very good friends of mine. All of them are healthy, transplanting people and helping a patient with this kind of disease. And also at the executive board of Latin American uh, 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 bone marrow transplant group, which has endorsed this technique for as a way to increase the number of patients with access to this procedure. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to our last speaker, Professor Mohamed Moti. Uh, he's a, a works at the La San Antonio Vital in Paris, and is also faculty at the University of Marie and, and Pierre Marie Curie in Paris. He will give a talk uh, on the role of transplants in multiple, for multiple myeloma. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you very much, uh, Damiano and Sebastian, uh, for the kind uh, introduction and the uh, kind invitation that I really appreciate. Uh, I'm really uh, very grateful and feel privileged to be in part of this uh, wonderful uh, symposium, which is extremely useful, I think, uh, uh, these days. And I'd like to acknowledge here the visionary uh, initial idea of Professor Nida Wieser and Codera and many others establishing this WBMT network, which is really helping the transplant field worldwide moving forward. So I have been asked for the next few minutes or so uh, to give you a sort of an update about the latest data uh, in the transplant eligible patient uh, in the frontline treatment of multiple myeloma. So these are usually the young and fit patient. And obviously, as you may guess, this is a sort of a review of the research evidence and obviously you may know, you will notice that some of these uh, combinations are not approved or are not reimbursed everywhere. But obviously we can discuss uh, during the Q&A about uh, the positioning of each approach. These are my uh, disclosures. We already uh, heard uh, about the booming activity of uh, auto uh, transplant worldwide. And uh, this uh, autotransplant activity in myeloma uh, started initially in the mid-80s uh, uh, and progressively it started to increase. Originally, uh, the spirit was about delivering high-dose chemotherapy, namely melphalan with or without TBI. But then with time, progressively, the procedure uh, gets refined 
and actually now it includes different key steps and every step can be optimized can be improved and actually putting together all the steps you uh, may be able to achieve a successful transplant with some long-term survival for the patient here you can see the key steps these are the induction uh, therapy uh, which is uh, administered prior to the high dose chemotherapy uh, and prior to stem cell mobilization then you have uh, the uh, transplant procedure and high dose chemotherapy and then we have the post transplant therapy and usually it can include two components consolidation and maintenance therapy so over the last 10 years or so and thanks to different uh, randomized phase three trials uh, from uh, France, the IFM group, from Spain, Petema, uh, from Italy, uh, from Hopon, and many others. I think uh, we have a strong uh, uh, data suggesting that the optimal induction is a triplet induction uh, relying on a proteasm inhibitor with an IMID or with an alkylating agent. So when it comes to IMID, the two most popular regimens are VTB and VRD, bortezomib, thalidomide, dexamethasone, or bortezomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. Or we have the combination of bortezomib plus an alkylating agent, namely cyclophosphamide, VCD. This is the original CYBOR-D regimen, which was published 10 years ago by our Canadian colleagues. And uh, uh, all of these regimens uh, have been used widely uh, because they are effective and they can induce a high response rate prior to uh, high dose chemotherapy. So with this background, the next question in the myeloma community was about how can we do better than these triplets? And the short answer was about adding a monoclonal antibody. Because over the last few years, we have seen the advent of the monoclonal uh, antibodies in multiple myeloma, namely the anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies. And that was actually the spirit, the philosophy, the rational of these quadruplet induction regimens based on daratumumab. Daratumumab uh, was the first uh, anti-CD38 uh, antibody approved in relapse refractory multiple myeloma, but now it is approved in the frontline setting. And uh, in terms of induction, that was the so-called Cassiope trial uh, published in the Lancet uh, last year. This is a joint effort between the IFM group and the HOVON, and it's a relatively easy uh, design uh, in a multicenter, phase free, randomized setting, comparing classical standard of care VTD induction, bortezomib, thalidomide, dexamethasone, to daratumumab VTD. And the primary endpoint was about achieving stringent CR. And it is extremely important to achieve a deep response prior to high dose chemotherapy because we know very well that these responses achieved before are going to be useful after transplant. And the trial actually met its primary endpoint because we can see a relatively high rate of stringent CR compared with DARA VTD compared to VTD alone. And when you look to the CR rate, we're roughly around 40%. And here I would like to kindly draw your attention to the fact that when historically we used to, do, to, to, we used to use uh, uh, VAD, VAD, vincristin, idramycin, and dexamethasone, the maximum published CR rate was around 4%. And now we're talking about 
10 times more. And actually, despite the relatively short follow-up in the original publication, we can already see an advantage for the uh, DARA BTD induction in terms of progression-free survival, highlighting that everything you can give before transplant is going to improve your transplant results. Well, obviously, these are the DARA VTD results. However, and we heard this in the uh, original, uh, in the first talk uh, uh, in this webinar, uh, VRD is also very attractive uh, because lenalidomide is a very potent image uh, in multiple myeloma. Uh, it's less toxic compared to thalidomide. And now we do have generic lenalidomide in many places worldwide. And the question is, how does VRD and VTD compare? And actually, to make a long story short, uh, based on this uh, Spanish analysis, actually VRD looks slightly superior to VTD. And from a practical standpoint, that can be understood because uh, you have less toxicity and more uh, efficacy. And VRD actually is a very popular induction regimen uh, worldwide. So the next question is, well, if VRD is superior to VTD, how does it look like if you add daratumumab to VRD? And this is the so-called Griffin trial published two months ago uh, in uh, blood actually, and this is a phase two randomized trial uh, comparing the uh, standard of care, I would say, VRD uh, to uh, DARA VRD. And the uh, primary endpoint was similar to the DARA VTD trial I have shown you a few minutes ago and looking into the stringent CR, not only the CR. And we are here uh, around actually 42% uh, stringent CR and actually uh, more than 50 or 60% CR. So definitely uh, if you switch to VRD plus daratumumab, you can even uh, do better than um, uh, DARA VTD or VTD uh, alone or VRD alone. And actually uh, these responses keep on improving uh, over uh, time. And another important finding from uh, this trial is about the issue of MRD negativity. Because in the field of uh, multiple myeloma, it's not uh, anymore about only response rate. We are more and more looking into MRD, similar to what is being done in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute uh, myeloid leukemia, or CLL. And because we believe that MRD negativity is really a very good surrogate marker for long-term outcome. And to make a long story short, what we uh, can notice here is that after induction, up to 50%, 47% of the patient receiving their VRD uh, could achieve MRD negativity compared to less than 20% with VRD alone. And this is extremely important because we believe, and there are retrospective analysis suggesting that these patients are really going to enjoy long-term survival. And today, when we look into the registry data, the historical data, the standard risk multiple myeloma patient uh, with such modern induction auto-transplant and maintenance therapy are able to enjoy more than 10 years of survival. And actually, when you look to the different subgroup analysis, all patients, all characteristics can benefit from such a quadruplet uh, induction. And uh, just to give you a flavor of what's coming in the next couple of years, uh, in Europe, uh, we have finished this uh, other randomized phase three trial comparing DARA subcute plus VRD to VRD, a uh, per series trial, and hopefully uh, we'll uh, get uh, these results and they will be able to confirm the American Griffin uh, results. 
but our American colleagues are even moving uh, very quickly because if you are able to achieve better results with DARA VTD or DARA VRD, why not actually replacing bortezomib by carfizomib, which is the second generation proteasm inhibitor? So the goal is always to do better. And that is the spirit, the idea behind the DARA KRD regimen. So this is a sort of a Rolls-Royce regimen uh, for uh, induction. And that was presented uh, at the last ASH meeting by Dr. Costa uh, from uh, the US. And again, uh, you can appreciate that uh, we do have some very uh, impressive uh, MRD uh, uh, negativity after induction. Obviously, this is a single arm trial, not a comparative trial, and it needs to be uh, confirmed. So in summary, if you put all the available uh, prospective data looking into induction, you can appreciate that the quadruplet regimens uh, are really uh, the ones that can yield the highest stress constraint after induction. However, things may be a little bit more complicated because it's not only about the uh, drugs and the components of your induction, it's also about the number of cycles that you are able to deliver. And for instance, our Spanish colleagues, the Petema group, could show that if you use VRD, just by adding two additional cycles of VRD, six cycles of induction, toxicity allowing, actually you can uh, go up to 67% of response similar to what you would achieve with a quadruplet regimen. So I think the field of induction is moving uh, towards further improvement and we have to figure out whether it's about the length of induction or whether it's about the drug compositions. That was the induction story. I will not allude to stem cell mobilization and we heard uh, already uh, some uh, nice uh, talks about uh, cryopreservation versus using fresh. And I think this, these are really very amazing data about being able uh, to use these hematopoietic cells without the need for all the infrastructure uh, for uh, freezing or cryopreservation. Uh, when it comes to high-dose chemotherapy, I will not spend a lot of time on this uh, because all prospective trials uh, came into the conclusion today that nothing is doing better than melphalan 200 milligram per square meter. So melphalan looks like it's here to stay. The question is what about post melphalan the post uh, transplant uh, therapy and this is about consolidation and actually here i'd like to draw your attention to some recent results from the european myeloma network published 6 months ago in lancet hematology by dr cavo and the paper is uh, available and you can download it and look into all the details i wanted simply to draw your attention to the issue of single auto versus double auto. We know that auto is a quite heavy procedure, although the safety by itself is very good. The mortality is less than 1%, but in terms of patient tolerance, it can be a bit complicated. And double auto uh, has lost, uh, I mean, there were less enthusiasm to the double auto in the last few years because of the new drugs. However, what we uh, could see in this long-term follow-up from the EMN trial was about in high-risk cytogenetics, for instance, deletion 17 key patient, and we know this is really an unmet medical need because these patients are still not doing very good, uh, very well, despite the introduction of new drugs. Actually, uh, these high-risk cytogenetics patients uh, are uh, going to benefit uh, from a double uh, auto procedure because their PFS and overall survival are going to be improved. So I believe uh, whenever feasible, there is still room for double auto in a subgroup uh, of patients. However, we need to be fair and balanced, and uh, the benefit of a double auto uh, could not be demonstrated 
in all randomized trials. And for instance, this so-called Stamina trial performed in the US, it's a BNP CTN trial. Actually, this trial did not show a significant uh, outcome advantage for double auto. But then, of course, the devil is always in the details, and you have to look into what kind of induction regimen they have used and what kind of maintenance therapy they have used. And I'm more than happy to discuss this during the discussion. The second part of the post-transplant treatment is about maintenance. And uh, maintenance is about offering some gentle oral uh, treatment, uh, well tolerated, in order to maintain the response rate. Whereas in consolidation, the goal is to deepen the response rate immediately after transplantation. And I think now it is well established, although you have seen in the first talk of this webinar that uh, approval may be an issue. And for instance, lenalidomide is not approved worldwide. So accessibility and affordability uh, uh, of uh, these new drugs is always a matter of concern and we should uh, pay attention to these issues. Nevertheless, when it comes to maintenance, I think lenalidomide is widely used as a maintenance therapy. Obviously, we have data with thalidomide also showing overall survival advantage, but thalidomide is more toxic compared to lenalidomide. And thanks to trials in this meta-analysis from Italy, from CLGB, from IFM, but also thanks to the most recent myeloma 11 trial from the UK, I think lenalidomide is really a standard of care for maintenance uh, after transplant. However, we should not forget that protism inhibitors can be used for maintenance, especially in the high-risk cytogenetics. And bortezomib, at the time when we used it as IV drug, uh, was tested. Of course, today you can use it as subcute, uh, but also there are data uh, published uh, recently by Dr. Dimopoulos, randomized data showing that the oral protism inhibitor, exazomib, can be also an option. But I believe in the next uh, few years, the lenalidomide, uh, the maintenance story, is going to move beyond lenalidomide or beyond bortezomib, beyond exazomib as single agent, towards combining the agent. And for instance, uh, this ongoing phase three trial is testing uh, daratumumab subcute plus lenalidomide in terms of uh, maintenance. And that also highlights in terms of affordability, the issue of continuous therapy in multiple myeloma. And obviously we need to design a trials and some of these trials are ongoing. We're running some of these trials uh, for a fixed duration because from a pharmacoeconomic perspective, obviously continuous therapy is uh, less affordable compared to uh, fixed duration uh, therapy. So in summary, in the transplant eligible patient with multiple myeloma, things are moving, I think, in the right direction, are moving rapidly, uh, because probably, and this is already approved by EMA and FDA, uh, we are now going into the four drug combinations, something like daratumumab BTD or daratumumab BRD. I think whenever feasible and you have access double auto represents a good option for the high-risk cytogenetics. Lenalidomide maintenance is approved, is widely used. If not accessible, thalidomide can be uh, an alternative, but we need to pay attention to peripheral neuropathy because obviously that is going really to alter the quality of life of the patient. So at the end of the day, uh, here you can see the a summary of the philosophy of the treatment in the transplant eligible patient. And the goal uh, at the end is to try to achieve the uh, deepest response at the end of therapy. And in terms of multiple myeloma, uh, we should figure out how to measure this. And this is about the NGS or flow cytometry based MRD measurement, but also uh, myeloma is a bony disease. It's also about imaging, namely uh, PET scan. And if you are able to achieve such a very uh, deep level of MRD, 
negativity, actually, uh, we know these are the patients that will enjoy the longest survival. And some of them are actually can be considered in a situation of functional uh, cure. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And obviously, I'm more than happy uh, to take uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Hello, Mohammed. Then we have a couple of minutes for, for some uh, questions. Um, we, we have received questions from the chat and during the registration process. Um, I would like to summarize some of them. For example, um, Andrew, you know, you have shown that transplant is increasing all over the world and nothing seems to beat autologous transplant, as Mohammed mentioned. Do you think that the transplant rates will continue to increase during the, the next years? That's one question. And another for all the panelists is uh, how would you approach uh, treating myeloma in a resource and limited, set, limited setting when uh, newer agents are not available or, or, or extremely expensive? Thank you, uh, Sebastian. That's a great question. I think, um, I think you know, with respect to, to transplant, I mean, you know, clearly our new agents are quite effective, but again, the issue remains availability and cost. And there are many barriers in countries outside of, you know, Europe and North America and, and Latin America that have very limited access to the drugs. Um, for example, I have a patient uh, from Iraq and she, uh, you know, she was diagnosed in Iraq. And even though Velcade is approved in Iraq, you can't get it. And so you have to buy it on the black market. And so they ended up buying it. Who knows the potency, the quality of the drug. Uh, so there are real issues. And I think transplant is, is attractive because it is a one-time therapy. It can be administered once. It does not require continuous dosing. Uh, and I think, you know, we've seen some excellent presentations tonight that really highlight that it is still very effective, that it can be done in, in resource limited countries. And I think we will see transplant rates continue to increase worldwide. I have no doubt. And I think we just need, you know, better education, uh, improvement of infrastructure and, and commitment from, from healthcare systems that they will support this. So we have only a very few seconds left. So I would like to have a, a very quick question, very quick answer to a, a very quick question to all the panelists just to, to finish up. Uh, in this COVID-19 time, uh, imagine if you are in a, in a low income country or in a low resource country, uh, would you delay the bone marrow stem cell transplant for myeloma patients or you feel comfortable moving forward? Quick, quick answer. Mohammed. I would say it depends where you are. If you decide to postpone it based on the phase three trials, there is no harm in terms of overall survival. But then you have to provide a longer induction. And there was a question about what would be the minimalistic induction in a low resources uh, you know, place. Well, I would say VCD is the minimum because you have bortezomib generic in some places Cyclophosphamide is easy and relatively cheap and dexamethasone. Thank you. Well, that's very helpful. Anybody else to add to this? Amaro, what do you think? Uh, so, so, sorry, I, I was, I was uh, 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 answering some question by the chat. Would you please repeat the question? Sorry. COVID-19, do you delay the uh, time? Okay, okay. Uh, yes, thank you. At the beginning of the pandemic in Colombia, that was six months ago, yes, we stopped the transplant for a couple of months. But now we are six months after the first case was diagnosed in Colombia, and we uh, restore. We 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 start again to do it transplant myeloma patient. Uh, for a couple of months, we stopped the the, the, the activity. Sorry, sorry, I was I was answering some question by the chat. Thank you. Uh, so I think with this, I think we it's it's um, 8:01 in Chicago. So we are uh, we finished our our time here. I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, it's been fantastic, very helpful. I hope the participants will enjoy and will have uh, uh, the chance to, to view this, to, to uh, see this webinar again uh, on the webpage of the WBMT and ASTCT, uh, probably starting from tomorrow. So thank you again and have a great day or evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.